The National Health Service in the United Kingdom was one of the first healthcare systems in the world to give priority to patient safety. The work done in the UK over the last few years has involved taking account of the things that go wrong in healthcare. The frequency of medical error and unsafe care is much higher than we've realised in the past. Something like one in every ten patients admitted to hospital suffer from some form of medical error. It may not always lead to serious harm, but in some cases, sadly, it leads to major disability and even death. One of the incidents we've examined in depth is the phenomenon of intrathecal injection error. This is where a drug intended for use intravenously is given instead into the spine, mistakenly. The patient then experiences paralysis and even death. When we've analysed these incidents in depth, we've spotted all sorts of errors and weaknesses in the system which provoke unsafe care to be given. By analysing these and by learning from them, we've tried to work out the ways in which this error can be prevented in the future. There are around 50 recorded incidents around the world of intrathecal injection error. Many more may not even have been recorded. From the incidents we are aware of so far, we know that they often occur in similar circumstances to different people at different times and even in different places. Experts call this situation an error trap. There's a common cause and probably a common solution. With this film, the World Alliance for Patient Safety is making the experience of the United Kingdom available worldwide. We hope that by studying this scenario and discussing it afterwards, you'll be able to see the many ways in which unsafe systems can provoke unsafe care. By generalising the experience of this particular incident, we hope that you'll be able to see the ways in which strengthening systems play a role in reducing the impact of error. This can help make healthcare even safer in the future. Oh, morning. Hi there. Hi there. Oh, Dr. Livingston. Hi there. Hi there. Dr. Livingston. Yeah, telephone. Oh, thanks, Sam. Excuse me, Duncan. Hello? Dr. Livingston? Yeah. It's Ramesh Shah, pharmacy here. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's about Mrs. Jane Hughes. I've seen this prescription for uh, methotrexate you sent down. You've already got her down for her IV this morning, and I've only sent her in Christian up. I was wondering if um, there'd be a mistake. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to talk to you about that. Mrs. Hughes is having both her procedures on the same day. She's got a big work commitment in a couple of days' time that she can't get out of. Yes, but you see, we don't... I have we discussed don't, uh, it with Dr. Munro, and he's agreed that the treatment should go ahead. He signed the prescription. Yes, I see. But look, Fiona, this is very irregular. I assume that uh, you'll be taking the full responsibility. Yes. OK, then, look, I'll uh, prepare it for this afternoon. Thanks, Ramesh. Sorry about that. Sister Lynch, I'd like you to meet Dr. Campbell. He's just joined us, and he's going to be working with me over the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I have to say, Duncan, you're going to be giving us some much-needed support. Glad to hear it. Hello, sister. Pleased to meet you. Welcome to the unit. Thanks very much. Oh, by the way, Anne... Mrs. Hughes will already be on your list this morning for her IV, mm -hmm. but she's also having her intrathecal this afternoon. She's got a big meeting at work in a few days' time, so we're going to try and fit her in for both procedures today. I didn't know she'd gone back to work. She's only just started. She's taking it easy. She's only a couple of days to begin with. Right. So, Duncan, your papers and NTN number should be through in a day or so, but meanwhile, welcome aboard. Thanks very much. Ah, that's my big problem. I'll take it through here. I'll see you both later, OK? Sure. Bye-bye. Oh, Dr. Livingston, before you go, I uh, just wanted to be clear about the amount of clinical work Dr. Campbell will actually be doing. How much have we got? He'll take on virtually anything I would. If he's unsure about anything, then I'm always here to help. So he's familiar with the IT rules? Well, I would certainly expect so. He's very senior, Anne. He can do just about anything I can. But Fiona, he's not on the IT register yet, is he? No, but I'm seeing Dr. Munro about that later and we'll sort it out then. Oh, Simon, I wanted a word. So he's fine with any of our procedures? Well, he's here on the personal recommendation of Dr. Munro's sister. So as far as I'm concerned, if Dr. Munro thinks he's competent, I'm prepared to go along with that. Now, he'll be acting as the specialist registrar, and I'm hoping that you and your staff will give him every assistance. Of course we will. Right. But Jane Hughes is intrathecal. That will still be under your care, won't it? Yes, I'll be there. Hi, Abby. It's Jane Hughes here. 
Um, Abby, I'm going to be late. I'm stuck in the most... Oh, sister, Jane Hughes just phoned. Apparently there's been a really nasty accident on the motorway and she's caught in the tailback. Great. Yeah, she says she's going to be quite late. At least two hours. Oh, what a day to be late. Look, Abby, I'll be off shift by the time she gets here. I've got to leave a bit early for a dentist appointment. I'll put everything in the notes, but I'm going to miss the handover. So can you make sure that Sister Roberts knows what's happening? Of course. I'll get the notes ready for her. All right, darling. Are you okay? Good boy. Being a really good boy. We'll be there soon. I'll be there as soon as I possibly can. Do try to calm down. It should only take me half an hour at the most. I'll see you as soon as possible. Oh, is everything okay? Not really, sister, no. Actually, that was my mother on the phone. My father's had a coronary. I've got to get over to the general. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, obviously, you must go. Thank you. Look, Dr. Campbell will cover for me. Could you show him around and take him through the notes when you get a chance? Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't had a chance to see the notes myself yet, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Oh, I'm sure we'll manage. Don't worry. Just going to be with your father. I hope he's okay. Thanks. I'll call him later. Okay. Yeah? Can you cover for me this afternoon? Sure. I'm sorry about the late notice. It's my father. He's had an MI, and I want to be with him. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Of course. No problem. Thank you. I've asked Sister Roberts to go over a few things with you. I'm sure between you, you'll manage fine. Sure. Good luck. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Simon, it's Fiona Livingston. I'm sorry about the short notice. My father's had a coronary. I've got to get over to the general. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Excuse me. I'm Dr. Campbell, covering for Dr. Livingston today. Oh, hello, Dr. Campbell. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, listen, have, have you seen uh, Sister anywhere? Sister Roberts? Yeah, there she is, down there by the nurse's station. Sister Roberts, thanks very much. Okay. Sister Roberts, I'm Dr. Campbell, covering for Dr. Livingston today. Um, I understand she's arranged for an SHO to give us a hand this afternoon. Dr. Simon Robinson, is he here yet? No, not yet. Abby? Has Mrs. Hughes arrived yet, please? No, she's just called in. She's about ten minutes away. Mrs. Hughes, she's, she's one of mine. I better get down to pharmacy for the chemo. Thanks very much. See you later. Okay. When Mrs. Hughes arrives, can we make sure that Bay 8's ready for her, please? Yes, of course, Helen. Thank you. Come in. Hi. I've just come over from St. Stephen's unit. I'm covering for Dr. Livingston. I've come to pick up the chemotherapy for Mrs. Jane Hughes, intrathecal methotrexate. She's under Dr. Monroe. All right. I don't know if we've met, have we? Dr. Campbell, I'm Charlotte Green. Oh, and nice. you'll be performing the procedure today, will yeah, you? Yeah, I will be, yeah. Right, I'll just check the register. Just the procedure. Um, I don't seem to have you down. Well, it should have been sorted out with Dr. Monroe by now. And I think that Dr. Livingston spoke to Mr. Shah earlier on. OK, then. Sorry about this. Take a seat. Let's have a look on the database. Campbell, Duncan Campbell. I mean, it should be there. There's no sorry. question it should be there. I I'm sorry, I I'm just a bit pushed for time, that's all. Um, oh, yes, there you are. Sorry about this. Hello, pharmacy. Yes, yes, that's right. And what's the patient's name again? Ah, uh, sure, that's fine. Be ready by four this afternoon, OK? Great, bye. Um, it seems he's only just put you on the list. Um, now, your patient, would that be a Jane Hughes? Yeah, that's not. Right, I'll just check this is ready for you. Thanks. Definitely running right now, I said. Here we are, Doctor. Methotrexate, two milligrams in two mils. Right. This is pen. Sorry, 
sorry, doctor, excuse me for a moment while I take this. Hello, pharmacy. Yes, he is, but I'm afraid he's on lunch at the moment. Can I take a message? And what extension is that? Fine, bye. Now, where were we? Jane Hughes. Hospital number 3267980. Date above 261274. Batch number BX4372. Two nine four. Excellent. Good stuff. Uh, now, if you could just sign here and we've got capitals here. With pleasure. I've had a nightmare, Jeremy. Oh, I'm so sorry. I feel awful. Oh, well, don't worry. Gosh, does not he grow? <sighs> yeah, he's into everything. Where are we today, Abby? Well, I'm not quite sure what's happening today. They're having a few problems. Oh. But I'm pretty sure we're in Bay 8. Right. Okay. Yes, it's this one. Look, can I take your bag? Oh, thanks. Okay. Ah, sister, has Mrs Hughes arrived yet? Yes, she is. Just settling in now. Great. Look, would you check this methotrexate with me, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks a lot. Jane Hughes, Hughes number 326798. Can I borrow your pen? Okay. I've left mine in pharmacy. There we go. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Look, would you put this in the fridge for me while I go and deal with this? Thanks a lot. Hello, sister. Hi, Simon. Is Mrs Hughes here yet? Yeah, she's just checking in now. Thanks for helping out. I've left our notes on the side and I'll be with you in a minute. No problem. So, how's George? He's a bit hot and bothered, actually. We had a terrible tantrum in the car on the way here. Oh, oh, I don't really blame him. We were stuck bumper to bumper for hours. It was awful. Anyway, he's settling down with his dad now, so... Could you pass me my walkman, Abby? It's in my bag. Oh, I'll just do your blood pressure and then I'll get it for you. Hi, Abby. Oh, hi, Simon. I don't see you here very often. No, I've been on nights. Just come on. Oh. Oh, could you get James Walkman out of that bag for me, please? So, what can I do for you? Dr. Livingston asked me to give you a hand this afternoon. Seems like she's got her hands full. Oh, great. Sorry, um, Mrs. Hughes, isn't it? Yes. I'm Dr. Robinson. Hi. How are you feeling? Pretty awful, actually. I've been stuck in the car for hours. I'm so sorry to hold you all up. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Hi, it's Mrs. Hughes. I'm Dr. Campbell, covering for Dr. Livingston this afternoon. Hi, Dr. Campbell. I heard about her father. It's awful. Will you be all right? I'm sure he's in very capable hands. Ah, you must be Dr. Robinson. Thanks very much for helping us out at such short notice. No worries. Happy to help. Now, uh, Mrs Hughes, you understand what treatment you'll be having this afternoon? Yes, I do. Right. Let's have a look at Mrs Hughes' blood results then, shall we? Mm. Yep. That all looks fine. And the consent form? Yes, I have. Observations all right? Yeah, fine. Right. Would you check the wristband with me, please? Right. It's Mrs Jane Hughes. Hospital number 3267980. Date of birth 2612.74. Good. Looking perfect like that. Can you get some help, please? Abby! I've got to go, Dr. Cannon. If the need is a presume they'll call, let's just get on with this. I'll get that for you. Great. Look, listen, before you do that, would you just um, check the local with me and then I'll prep the skin? Sure. Look, I've asked Dr. Campbell twice today to call me. Will you pass my message, please? Yeah.
now. You will feel just a little bit of pressure here. There we are. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Anything important? I'm not sure, really. I've taken a message. There you go. Right, so uh, who was it? Someone from admin. They want you to give him a ring back. <laughs> That's the thud time today. Right, I'm ready for the chemo now. Simon, I'm sorry. Would, would you mind going and picking it up from the from the fridge? I think we've lost the staff nurse completely now. It certainly seems like it. I think there's a problem on the wall. I'll find out what's happening. Thanks very much. Is everything all right, Mrs. Hughes? Won't be much longer now. I'm afraid Abby's going to be a while yet. I've just seen her rushing around. Look, we can't afford to waste any more time. You'll just have to check it with me. Is that okay? Okay. Fine. Jane Hughes. Yeah. Hospital number 326-7980. DFB 26-1274. Yeah. Expiry date 080903. Everything okay? Simon. Dr. Campbell? Yeah, everything's yeah, fine. fine. I understand you've got a bit of a problem on the ward. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Staff now shouldn't be too much longer. Actually, we're nearly finished here now. Mm -hmm. Tell me, has my next IT patient arrived yet? Yeah, he's in the waiting room. I have explained with him, mate. Uh, can you check his blood results? They're not looking okay. good. Okay, thanks. All right. Ignore it. Just ignore it. You will thank Dr. Livingston for me, won't you? It's such a help you fitting me in like this. Of course I will. It's not a problem. Thanks. Is that okay? Okay, I'm fine. Right. Vincristine. Two milligrams in two mils. Right. That's it. Got a plaster? Excellent. Okay. Brilliant. Sorry to hold you up. You can't have finished already. Yeah, we have, yeah. I've got the megatrexate. So what have you given her? Someone call Dr. Monroe, please. The film you've just seen provides a shocking example of how a series of errors can lead to catastrophic harm to a patient. The first question you might like to ask is, who was responsible for this tragic outcome? The most obvious answer may be Dr. Campbell. He mistakenly injected vincristine into the patient's spine. However, I want you to consider a far more critical question. Why did Dr. Campbell find himself in such a position? sitting in front of a patient with an open spinal needle in their back, having been handed the incorrect and potentially lethal drug. In reality, Dr. Campbell's error was the final act in a chain of events, each of which, had it been identified at the time, may well have prevented this tragic outcome. 
It is therefore important to carefully review cases such as this. As much as possible, we need to do this without blaming the individuals involved. That is not to say that individuals should not be held accountable for their actions. However, although apportioning blame may be emotionally satisfying, it is likely to drive problems underground and impede an honest and far-reaching understanding of the risks. We need to address these risks to ensure the safe care of future patients. Let us return to the film and identify some of the factors that played a part in this error. In most healthcare settings worldwide, there are strict frameworks in place regulating the use of chemotherapy drugs like vincristine. These include prohibitions against storing such drugs in a fridge with other medicines and giving them in conjunction with other therapies. In many countries, there are also regulations specifying that a registered chemotherapy nurse must be present during the procedure and that the treatment must be given in a special room or bay. These types of frameworks and regulations are known as standard operating procedures or guidelines. These standard operating procedures and guidelines apply widely and are not specific to the use of drugs like vincristine. For example, well known are the Advanced Trauma Life Support Guidelines from the American College of Surgeons and the World Health Organization's Pain Ladder for Safe and Effective Administration of Opiate Analgesia. In the film we have just seen, you should clearly note that the standard operating procedures and guidelines were not adhered to. Yes, it's about Mrs. Jane Hughes. I've seen this prescription for uh, methotrexate you sent down. You've already got her down for her IV this morning and I've only sent her vincristine up. The methotrexate should not have been dispensed on the same day as vincristine. A mix-up of these two drugs could lead to fatal consequences and a protocol was in place to prevent this. Had it been adhered to, the error may have been avoided. OK then, look, I'll uh, prepare it for this afternoon. Factors that may have led to the pharmacist breaking the protocol are many and varied. They include the pressure of work and a hierarchical management structure which does not encourage constructive questioning of the doctor in charge. Can pick up the chemotherapy for Mrs Jane Hughes, intrathecal methotrexate? Dr Campbell should not have been allowed to administer chemotherapy. I don't seem to have you down. He was not confirmed as having the skills to do this. Despite this, the nurse was persuaded to allow him to practice on the ward and the pharmacist allowed him to pick up the prescription. A system was in place, but not adhered to. Here we are, Doctor. Methotrexate, two milligrams in two minutes. Sadly, in many areas of healthcare, when these procedures are in place, their purpose is often misunderstood and they may even be treated with contempt. Lack of organisational leadership, poor communication, high workloads and inadequate education and training all contribute to the lack of adherence. Actually, standard operating procedures and guidelines can be a great protection against error. Their objective is to make patients and practitioners as safe as possible each and every time that a procedure or action is undertaken. Standard operating procedures do not destroy clinical autonomy or decision making. Rather, they provide an evidence-based, agreed framework for protecting patients against error. Wherever possible, they standardise the procedures in place so that everyone understands their role and what is expected of them. Where standard operating procedures and guidelines are present, they must be adhered to. Where they are not in place, appropriate measures should be taken to establish them. We need to make sure we have an organisation-wide view of standard operating procedures and guidelines so these essential components of safe care do not fall by the wayside. We need to see such procedures as the hallmark of professionalism and good patient care rather than as an enemy. When standard operating procedures and guidelines are present, we need strong and visible leadership to ensure they are adhered to. For your organisation, ask yourself the following questions. Could standard operating procedures and guidelines be put in place to make delivery of care safer? Are standard operating procedures and guidelines being adhered to? And if not, which pressures prevent their operation? Is there a culture of contempt within your organisation for standard operating procedures and guidelines?
We can only really be sure that we're delivering safe care for patients if all the healthcare workers involved have received the right training and are up to date. A healthcare professional who has not received appropriate training or guidance may feel under low pressure to just do the job. There can be a lot of pressure to cope with the workload by operating outside their competence, especially for junior staff. Such staff may not be well placed to judge their own level of competence. They may be over or underconfident because of their limited experience. This is a potentially dangerous situation where errors can easily occur. In the film, it was obvious that nobody had a clear understanding of the level of training or experience that the newly appointed Dr. Campbell had. Oh, Dr. Livingston, before you go, I uh, just wanted to be clear about the amount of clinical work Dr. Campbell will actually be doing. How much have we got? He'll take on virtually anything I would. If he's unsure about anything, then I'm always here to help. So he's familiar with the IT rules? Well, I would certainly expect so. He's very senior, Anne. He can do just about anything I can. But Fiona, he's not on the IT register yet, is he? No, but I'm seeing Dr. Munro about that later and we'll sort it out then. Sister Lynch, in fact, queried this several times with his colleague, Dr. Livingstone. Despite this lack of clarity, Dr. Campbell was left in charge once Dr. Livingstone left the ward. Sister Roberts, I'm Dr. Campbell, covering for Dr. Livingstone today. A culture where healthcare workers help each other, especially when staff are stretched, may inadvertently increase the risk to patients. Often, many staff may not easily recognise the boundaries of their own expertise and experience. Poorly trained healthcare workers can be a major contributing factor, leading to adverse events. Many countries are good at ensuring a certain standard as part of undergraduate training. However, in many cases, the last assessment a healthcare professional faces is at their university or college. Assessments are not just about ensuring a certain and sustainable level of skill, knowledge or competence. They're also a reflection of a wider culture of safe and effective practice. Education and training are critical components in the quest to improve patient safety. At the very least, all healthcare workers must understand the key concepts of patient safety. For those already in practice, programmes must be developed to give them the skill to continue to practice safely. Most of all, healthcare professionals should know and understand safety procedures in their own local service contexts. In other high-risk industries, careful attention is paid to ensuring the ongoing competence of frontline staff. For example, a typical airline pilot would probably have something like a hundred assessments of their competency over the course of their career. In some countries, doctors have none. For your organisation, ask yourself the following questions. How do you know that the colleagues you work with have received the training they need to do their job well? Do you have a way of assessing colleagues you work with to ensure they're competent? Do you have a framework in place to ensure induction with local procedures? Do you know what you should do if you have concerns about the competence of your colleagues and the safety of their practice? Would you be supported in raising your concerns? And finally, how would you know if your healthcare system allowed an unskilled or untrained healthcare professional to practice? Clear communication and effective team working between different healthcare workers from different professional groups is essential for delivering safe care for patients. In many countries, healthcare is becoming more and more specialised, and clear communication within the multidisciplinary team is vital to ensure there is clarity of roles and responsibilities, procedures and outcomes. Time and time again, research has shown that ineffective communication and poor team working has been a major cause of an adverse event and heightens the risks to patients. It's Campbell, Duncan Campbell. I mean, it should be there. There's no question sorry. it should be there. I'm sorry, I, I'm just a bit pushed for time, that's all. Definitely run it right now, that's it. Ah, sister, has Mrs Hughes arrived yet? Yes, she is, just settling in now. Great. Look, would you check this methotrexate with me, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Can I borrow your pen? Okay. I've left mine in pharmacy. There we go. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Look, would you put this in the fridge for me while I go and deal with this? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. In the film, 
it should be obvious that these two terse exchanges and communication breakdowns contributed to the error. It is not just verbal communication that can be at the heart of serious error. These professionals are not working effectively as part of a multi-professional team. They're not respecting each other's roles and responsibilities and supporting each other in delivering a common goal, the safe and effective care of their patients. As you can see, without verbal handover, the written note had no context. In the midst of a complex and stressful situation, important messages that should have been clearly communicated between staff were lost. The lack of effective staff handovers and lack of clarity in individual roles gives opportunities for misunderstandings to arise. Communication can be aided hugely just by stepping aside into a quiet spot, even if only briefly. Staff need to have mutual respect for each other's role and professionalism. They need to be able to respect and value constructive questioning and deal honestly with misunderstandings. A hierarchical structure and a culture where junior staff are afraid to speak up and effectively challenge or query the decision-making of senior staff can contribute to poor team working and the resulting poor communication. Environmental factors such as stress caused by understaffing and overwork also play a part. An appreciation of the cultural differences is a key skill for successful communication in our multicultural world. This is particularly important in healthcare, especially when workers and patients may be from different cultural or socioeconomic backgrounds, making some of the sensitive aspects of health difficult to address. Differences in language, customs and conventions and even religion all have the potential to lead to poor communication and misunderstandings. Some organisations still have a culture where respectful dialogue and inquiry is not encouraged. We need to move away from this to a culture which requires open and honest communication between all players in the healthcare setting. Handover and clear documentation need to be actively encouraged and promoted. Effective teamwork needs to be encouraged. For your organisation, ask yourself the following questions. To what extent in your healthcare setting have you addressed the need to have effective multidisciplinary communication? Do staff value or even know about each other's roles? Can junior staff approach senior staff and make a legitimate inquiry about the safety of a situation? And finally, do you work well as a team? Correct labelling, storage and dispensing of medicines is vital to protect the patient against potentially lethal harm. Medication errors in some studies have accounted for up to 30% of medical errors. Safety of medication delivery is thus one of the most pressing issues of the patient safety agenda. In the film, almost everything that could have gone wrong with Jane's medication delivery did go wrong. This chain of events started long before she was administered the wrong drug. Standard operating procedures and guidelines to prevent vincristine being stored with the methotrexate should have been adhered to. Ah, you must be Dr. Robinson. Thanks very much. Dr. Robinson and Dr. Campbell had never met before. They did not have specific training to be checking these drugs. It should have been the certified nurse that was involved at this level. Traditionally, healthcare workers have worried mainly about the issues of adverse drug reactions, where the patient has been given the right drug but suffers from a side effect. A separate area which concerns itself with ensuring the right standard operating procedures and guidelines are being followed and the right dispensing and delivery systems are being used is known as medication safety practice. This is an important area which examines healthcare systems to try to prevent errors such as that in the film. We all know how bad a doctor's handwriting can be, yet sometimes the medical notes are the only way that healthcare professionals have to communicate with each other. Therefore, medical records need to be clear and unambiguous. They need to provide an accurate way of conveying important, actionable information. It is essential that all hospitals, clinics and treatment centres have established policies for ensuring medication safety. In general, whether we are dealing with Vincristine or not, there are certain principles that you may want to consider. For example, all drugs must be clearly labelled and labels must be easily visible. Drugs must be properly checked by the designated person against the patient's medical records and the drug chart. And for high-risk treatments like chemotherapy, drugs must only be given by nurses and doctors with specialised registered training. For your organisation, 
Ask yourself the following questions. Are medical notes easily accessible, kept regularly up to date and easily legible? Do your procurement policies ensure consistency of drug purchasing and checking mechanisms to detect potential errors such as look-alike and sound-alike medications? And finally, do you have systems in place to ensure only those properly trained are able to be involved in the delivery of high-risk drugs? Of all parties in a healthcare setting, patients often have the least input into their care. Yet, much research indicates that patients can not only enhance the quality of their care, but can prevent errors. When arriving at the hospital, Jane was stressed because of a long car journey through gridlock traffic, and probably also because of the trauma of living with cancer and facing more unpleasant procedures. Nevertheless, she was put at ease by the nurse, who asked her how she was feeling and inquired about her family. So far, so good. However, once Jane had been escorted to the treatment bay, she was no longer treated as an individual. The multidisciplinary team failed to acknowledge her as someone who could provide valuable input into her own care. She was not even asked what she had come for. Could she have had a card by which her treatment was checked with her as well? Would that have provided an additional safety barrier? Jane might have been able to spot that the team was proceeding with the intrathecal drug injection before she had been given her intravenous treatment. Had she been able to point that out, what followed might not have happened. It was the hospital's responsibility to ensure that Jane's care was safe, but involving Jane actively in her care may have prevented the terrible outcome. A patient who is familiar with the procedure is a vital resource for any healthcare worker to draw on. They may be able to spot discrepancies in the treatment plan and any deviations from standard operating procedures, discrepancies in communication or odd drug labelling. Patients are often far more insightful than we give them credit. Adopting a more patient-centred approach, trying to look at the situation from the patient's point of view, will make patients feel more relaxed, more comfortable and lead to more effective consultation and diagnosis. It enhances quality and promotes safety. It may also save time and money. For your organisation, ask yourself the following questions. What happens in your organisation to ensure that patients are active partners in their own treatment? How could your organisation play a more active role in this challenge? And finally, could other means of engaging patients be used, such as posters, leaflets and patient treatment cards? The World Alliance for Patient Safety believes that we need to understand the nature of these contributing factors. We must learn from the errors and harm we unintentionally cause to patients in order to reduce the risks for future patients. We need to act on this learning and make improvements throughout our healthcare systems. Commitment from governments, hospital management and clinical leaders is vital to achieve this. We must also work collaboratively with patients. But let me finish with five challenges. Firstly, do you have standard operating procedures and guidelines in your workplace? Are they adhered to? If not, why not? Could you develop these if they're not already in place? Secondly, does your workplace have a framework in place to ensure healthcare workers are up to date with training and are they safe to practice? Thirdly, do you communicate effectively with your colleagues as part of a multidisciplinary team? Fourthly, is information about the safe use of drugs accessible to you in your workplace? And finally, have you engaged your patients in their own care? Analyzing and understanding errors like this will take us away from a blame culture and move us to a situation where we can offer safe, high quality and sustainable care to our patients, not just now, but in the future.